Now, friends, we've come to the epistles that are customarily called general epistles. That is, any particular church. Actually, they are also designated Catholic epistles in the sense that they're universal because they are not addressed to a particular individual church, but to the church as a whole, but to a particular group in the church. And here, it's to the diaspora. It begins with James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, I want to go into that in just a moment. But when he says the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, it's obvious to us what he means. He means the believers in Israel. He's writing to the Christian Jews of that day. After all, the early church was 100% Jewish for quite a period of time. And then a few Gentiles began to come in, and then a flood, a great What we would call a revival broke out in the heart of the Roman Empire where Turkey is today. And that's where the seven churches were. And literally there probably could be said several million turned to Christ. And I think there's an abundance of evidence for that today. But many of these were Israelites, and these epistles are sent in that direction. And the epistle of James has been compared to the book of Proverbs, for instance. There are many similarities. And then the others have compared it to the Sermon on the Mount. And that, may I say, is also accurate because, after all, this man James was a blood brother, half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that probably we ought to have a word to say now about the James that we're talking about. Back in Hebrews, you remember we had a problem of authorship. Who wrote Hebrews? Did Paul write Hebrews? I believe he did. But there are others that think Dr. Luke did, others Barnabas. And so they've come up with quite a few. And we have a problem of authorship here in the epistle of James. There's no question but what James wrote James, but what James was it? There are those that have found six different Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. Well, it's quite obvious that in several places they're talking about the same James. And I believe that you can find at least three that are clearly identified. And some, of course, make that four. But I would settle for three. And what we have here is, first of all, there's James, the brother John. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, and they were called by our Lord's sons of thunder, you remember. Now, he was slain by Herod, and you will find that in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. You remember that Herod took James and slew him, and Simon Peter he put in prison. Then we have the second James that is mentioned, James, the son of Alphaeus, called James the Less. He's mentioned in the list of apostles, but very little is known concerning him. And I dismiss him automatically. Then we have the third James, and he actually is the Lord's brother. And that means he was a son of Mary and a son of Joseph. And that would make him a half-brother of the Lord Jesus, by the way. Now, we have a reference to him. In fact, at the beginning, you remember, his brethren did not believe in him at all. And we have it mentioned in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 55. Let me read that. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joe and Simon... And Judas, so that James is the one that we believe wrote the epistle of James. Now, he became head of the church at Jerusalem. And in the 15th chapter of Acts, why we find that at that great council in Jerusalem, he seemed to preside over it. He seemed to have been the chairman. And he at least made the summation and brought it to a decision 
evidently led by the Holy Spirit. And I think that Paul actually had reference to him. You remember it over in Galatians, the second chapter, Paul had something to say about him. And I'd like to turn there and just read that verse very briefly. Verse 9 of chapter 2 of Galatians says, "...then when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision." What we have here is the man that we believe is the author of this epistle. Now, it was apparently written in about 45 to 50, not any later than 50 or not any earlier than 45, but probably nearer 45. Now, there have been those that have said that James wrote his epistle to combat the teaching of Paul, that he emphasizes works and Paul was emphasizing faith. Now, I'm going to go into that later on here. But may I say to you very candidly, that couldn't be true because the first epistle that Paul wrote was 1 Thessalonians. And the earliest that could have been was 52 to 56. So that even Paul's first epistle was not written until after James had written. James is the first writer in the Scripture, if you take it chronologically and Very frankly, when you look at it like this, why, you have to admit, and I heard, by the way, a liberal speaking one time, and he made the the mistake of saying that James wrote in order to correct Paul and his doctrine of justification by faith. But that man hadn't looked into it very thoroughly, or he wouldn't have made that boo-boo. Actually, and I'll go into this later, the theme of James isn't works at all. It's faith, the same as Paul. He tells you what faith produces. Now, I'm going into that later on, so let me come back here to the introductory matters that have to do with this. And probably I ought to go into it this far, at least. You find that both men are putting an emphasis on faith and on works. They use the expression a great deal. I think James' entire theme throughout the epistle is faith and what faith does. And they give the two aspects of faith, of justification by faith. And Paul emphasizes both, by the way. He makes it very clear that faith is the way that you're justified, but that that faith produces works. And he could say, though, for by grace are ye saved, and not of works, lest any man should boast. And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But Paul also wrote, These things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. That's Titus 3.8. And then in Ephesians 2.10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in it. Now, faith is the root of salvation. Paul emphasizes that. Works are the fruit of salvation, and that's the thing that James emphasizes. Faith is the cause of salvation and works the result of salvation. And when Paul talks about works not saving you, he's talking about works of the law. And when James emphasizes that works are important and essential, he's talking not about works of law, but the works of faith. Show me your faith. Without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. And God looks down, sees your heart. He knows whether you believe or not. That is justification by faith. But your neighbor next door, he doesn't see your heart. He can only go by your works, by the fruit of it. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit in this epistle. Now, I consider the two key verses in this epistle, "...but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only." 
deceiving your own self. And then James 2.20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now, as we've indicated before, this is a practical epistle. And James was a very practical individual, apparently. Tradition says that he was given the name of Old Camel Knees. And the reason is he spent so much time in prayer. And he deals with practical issues like the ethics of Christianity, not doctrine. And he's really going to bear down on that, by the way. But he won't get away from faith at all. And the epistle of James, as we've indicated, has been compared to the book of Proverbs and also the Sermon on the Mount. And justification by faith is demonstrated by works, and justification by faith must be poured into the test tube of works and of words and worldliness and of a warning to the rich, by the way. Now, you have in the outline that I've given... In the first three chapters, the verification of genuine faith. Now, how can you tell? God tests faith, first of all, by trials, and we have that now here in the first 12 verses of the first chapter. Now, let me come back to verse 1 again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, he calls himself a servant of God, and that is actually a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses that term. Now, I do not know about you, but I'm confident, had I been the half-brother on the human side to him somewhere in this epistle, I'd have let you know it. Well, I would have done it in a very pious way, of course. I would have brought it in in a very humble way. But I sure would have let you know it. James doesn't do that. He calls himself a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at first, his brethren did not believe. Well, after all, they've been brought up with him. They played with him. They have seen him grow. They noticed he's unusual, but they don't think that he's the Savior of the world. You see... The thing we emphasized in Hebrews, our Lord Jesus was so human when he's here on his earth, even at first his own brethren did not. And, of course, the hardest people to reach is your family always, and yet they are the ones we ought to try to reach. Well, thank God, James came to know the Lord Jesus, not as his blood brother, but as his Savior, and then he became the bond slave. And you notice who he calls him. He gives him now the full name, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. And as we saw, Jesus is the human name. He knew him as Jesus, his half-brother. But also, he knew him as Christ, the Messiah that had come and died for the sins of the world. And that Jesus was not just the name, but he was called Jesus because he'll save his people From their sins. Now it's to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Wait a minute. I thought ten of them got lost somewhere. Oh no, friends, as we saw in Hosea, no tribes really got lost. God scattered them throughout the world, and James is just confirming it. They're scattered throughout the world. And they just don't happen to have settled in England or in the United States although there are a lot of them in both places. But the second largest population outside of the nation Israel is in Russia today. And they are in China. They're in Japan. They are scattered abroad. Now, he's written this to the believing Jews of that day that were scattered abroad. And the word greeting here, well, that's a little stilted. I think that is all right for Elizabethan days and for good old King James, but very frankly, the word literally means in the Greek, rejoice. He writes to him and he says, rejoice. This is James. He was no sour puss. He wasn't stuck in the mud. He's no dead stick by any means. This man had a lot of life to him. And now he says, rejoice. 
Now he's going to talk about rejoicing under unusual circumstances. He says, "...my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into various trials." I'm reading from the New Schofield Reference Bible, and I think they've done a marvelous job right through here in making these changes. When ye fall into various trials. In other words, when you're having trouble, don't start crying and boo-hooing as if something terrible has happened to you. Why, you're to rejoice. Count it all joy that God is testing you this way. And the question arises... Is the Christian to experience joy in depth in all the trials and troubles and tensions of this life? And I'm going to be very frank and say the answer is no. And that's not what James is saying. It actually leads to unreality to say, I'm reconciled to the will of God when trouble comes to you, when you're really not reconciled. I've talked to people who say, very piously say, oh, I'm reconciled, and they go around with a long face and weep half the time. Well, you are not reconciled to the will of God till you can rejoice, friends. Now, it's a form of insanity to adopt that pseudo-pious attitude. That the trouble is not given to us for trouble's sake. It's never an end in itself. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience. Now, God has a goal in mind. You're to count on it. And this has to do with the attitude of your heart towards your trouble. And the Arius tent here suggests the joy that is the result of the trial. You remember back in Hebrews, we were there not too long ago, and we said there in the 12th chapter that one method God uses is called chastening. And actually, it's child training. Now, trials actually are meaningless, suffering is senseless, testing is irrational, unless there's some good purpose served by them and a sound reason for them. In other words, God says there's a reason for them, and there's a good reason for it. All things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to His purpose. Now, when the external pressures of testing are upon us and we're placed in the fires of adversity and calamity and tragedy and suffering and disappointment and heartbreak, then the attitude of faith is that God has permitted it for a purpose and it's a high and lofty goal in view. And we know that God is working out something in our lives. Now, that doesn't mean, and I probably should keep on by saying it doesn't mean that we can understand the purpose. This is the test of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. God nothing does, nor suffers to be done, but what we would ourselves if we could see through all events of things as well as he. That is something that some One in the Middle Ages gave, and I forget now who it was, but it just came to me. What are some of the purposes served in the testing of faith? Has God put down any guidelines? Well, here in this epistle, it's the proof positive of genuine faith. Knowing here, knowing this, knowing what? That the testing of your faith worketh patience. Let me use a rather homely illustration. Out here at one of these aeroplane plants, Douglas plant, I had the privilege of leading to the Lord a secretary, one of the officers out there. Years ago, she attended my Thursday night Bible study, and she's the one who got Bible classes started in that great plant out there. She was a little bitty trick, a very small woman. She wouldn't weigh 90 pounds wringing wet. But she was a dynamo. And so I used to go out there and speak. She'd invite me to come out and speak to the group. And it was a very fine group of Christians, and there been several were saved out there. But while I was there, I saw something about how they build airplanes. And they start out with a new design of a plane. And it's 
put first on the drawing board, and then blueprints are drawn up, and then models of it are made, and they test the models. And then the construction begins, and two years goes by, and then there rolls off the assembly line one of these planes. And the question still is, will it fly? Will it perform? Will it stand the test? Well, they have test pilots. The test pilot takes it out on the runway, and he takes off. I sure wouldn't want that job. And he puts it through the paces up in there. Will it stand this kind of test? And it proves to be all that the maker said it was. And now there's confidence in the plane. And one of these airplane companies that fly planes, why, they buy it. And then they bring it up to the airport and passengers enter it. And that's the way that it gets into the air and becomes serviceable and useful. Now, genuine faith must be tested. Ore is brought to an assayer to see if it's gold or silver. And he puts a fire under it. He pours acid on it. And then he declares it's genuine. Now, God tests faith to prove that which is genuine. If someone has put it like this, the acid of grief tests the coin of belief. And there's a lot of truth in that. And God does it for a purpose. Now, listen to him. Verse 4. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now, that's a very marvelous verse. God tests you in order that he might produce something in your life, and that's patience. Now, how does God produce patience? Well, let's look at this. Let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now, it was patience that makes us a full-grown Christian. And the very interesting thing is, patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You never be patient but trying, and neither does the Holy Spirit place it on a silver platter and offer it to you as a gift. Patience comes through suffering and testing. You will never be a perfect. Now, that means a complete, a full maturation, a full orb personality as a Christian. And you can't be that without patience. Now, some Christians, therefore, never really grow up. They always remain babes. Every pastor knows that. I made this statement one time when I was pastoring downtown Los Angeles, and I got just a few little chuckles, not too many. I made the statement one morning that there were more babes in the main auditorium than there were down in the nursery. And I tell you, that won't get many laughs. And the difference is, though, the babies down in the nursery were beautiful. But the babes sitting in the auditorium, they're not very pretty. Why all this clamoring and criticizing and finding fault? There's turmoil and tension and trouble in so many churches. Well, you listen to David. David says in Psalm 131, and it's just a psalm of three verses, he says, "'Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty.'" Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Well, that's a marvelous statement, but listen to him. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that's weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. David said, in my life, I found out I had to grow up and I had to get off of milk and start really eating a good porterhouse steak and eating the bread of life. I had to grow up. And God tested David, and that enabled him to grow up. And Paul says that's one of the results of being justified by faith. He says, verse 3 of chapter 5 of Romans, "...not only so, but we glory or we joy in troubles, also knowing that trouble worketh patience." patience experience, and so on. There's a purpose in it all, you see. And the reason today we have so many shallow and superficial saints, and there's so many that have a feeling of insecurity as Christians. 
And then there's those that try to be the intellectual group, and they question the Word of God. Then there are those that think, well, if we enter the new morality, well, my suggestion is, why not try the old morality? But the problem is, they never grow up. They're little babes, you see. And God gives testing and trials to produce patience in our life. That's the way that we become patient. Now, patience, therefore, comes through suffering and testing. And that means we will grow up and become full-grown children of God. And how we need that today. God must send us trouble so that we learn patience and it'll produce hope and then it'll produce love in the lives of men and women. And I have watched that over the years. I knew a man always finding fault. And when I became pastor, I never had such a critic. And he began to tend on Thursday night. I noticed he brought his Bible and took notes. And less than 10 years, that man grew up. And believe me, in that time, God sent him a great deal of trouble. And I mean real trouble. He became one of the sweetest Christians I ever met in my life. My friend, you see, this type of testing is something that God gives to those that are his own. Now, will you notice the next verse here? He says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, I think the wisdom here, very candidly, is related to the thing that he's talking about here. I today have trouble and trials. I have problems. You have problems. How are you going to solve this problem? How are you going to meet this issue? How are you going to deal with this person? Well, we need to go to God in prayer. If you lack wisdom in this regard, wisdom is really the exercise and the practical use of knowledge. There are a great many people today who have knowledge, but they don't have any practical sense whatsoever. I used to play golf with a man who was a Ph.D., and I never shall forget one day, even to this good day, I get a good laugh about thinking about it. It started raining, and he looked at me, and in utter amazement, he said, What shall we do now? Well, <laughs> I want to say this to you. You don't have to have a Ph.D. degree to get in out of the rain. But here's a man with a Ph.D. degree, didn't have sense enough to get in out of the rain. I said, I think we better seek shelter. May I say to you that wisdom is to know how to act under certain circumstances of testing and trial. And when problems come up and questions come up, life is filled with these, my friend. And therefore, you and I need to have from God wisdom. Well, what do you do? Well, he's in the business of giving it out liberally. Here means he just simply helps you out in times like that. And he upbraideth not means it's pure, simple giving of good without any admixture of evil or bitterness. That's what you and I are to do. If we lack wisdom, let's go to God, and he's going to hear and answer your prayer. But listen to him, verse 6, "...but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering." Our problem today is, maybe that's not your problem. It's been my problem over a great deal of my Christian life is, I just haven't believed God. Now, don't misunderstand me. I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I believed with all my soul He saved men, and He's going to save me for heaven. I believe that with all my heart. But down here, where the rubber meets the road, that's where I've had my problems. I went through college in almost total unbelief. Now, what I mean by that is this. I didn't believe God could put me through college. I was a poor boy. I had to borrow money. I had to work. I had to work at a full-time job. And it was difficult. And every year I'd finish, I couldn't think I could come back the next year. And lo and behold, God always had opened up a door. And I actually went through college a miserable fellow. And I look back over it now. Boy, the fun I could have had if I'd only believed God. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavered. Why don't you believe God today, friend? And I'm talking to you as a Christian friend. You've got a long face today. 
you're wondering how this is going to work out and how that's going to work out. I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. May I say to you, why don't you believe God? Why don't you trust Him? Turn it over to Him. Do you lack wisdom? And believe me, I know this. I do not have the brains to meet the problems of life. I'm not capable today of actually living in this complex civilization. But I got a heavenly Father, friends, and He can supply even the wisdom that I need and that you need. And then He says here, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. You say, well, I believe God's going to work this out. And then when the time comes, we jump at it ourselves and we leap at it and make our own decision. I've done that several times. I turned it over to the Lord. I believed him. But the next day I didn't believe him. And I decided since nothing had shown up by way of a solution, I'd solve it myself. That's when I made my mistake. He's like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now he says, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you're going to work it out, then God can't work it out for you. If you're going to go in like a bull in a china closet and try to work something out, why not turn it over to God? Now he gives a proverb here, and this is a good one. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now that's something again that we saw back in Hebrews. That was the big problem of Israel, you remember. She was like a silly dove in Hosea. God says, like a silly dove. She flies off down to Egypt, flies up to Assyria, turns first to one and then the other, but not to God. How many times today that you and I, in this day in which we live, a problem comes up and we go here to try to solve it. We go there to try to solve it. And we go to every place And all of a sudden, it occurs to us, we never took it to God. When you start out the day, do you turn these things over to God? When I used to do a great deal of counseling as a pastor, and I'd meet many new people during the day, there's a prayer. I always prayed in the car when I was driving on the freeway. And believe me, when you're driving the freeways in Southern California, you better learn to pray. And so... I would pray, and one of the prayers that I always prayed was, Lord, I'm going to meet some new people today, and I don't know how to treat them. This man may be a wonderful friend and may be able to help me get out the Word of God. But this man, this other man, he may be a man that is going to put a knife in my back and going to hurt me and hurt my ministry. Lord, help me to know the difference today. Help me to be able to put my arm around that man that I can help. And help me to be wary of the man that's going to hurt me and not help me at all. Lord, give me wisdom today. We need wisdom, you see, in meeting the issues of life. Now, here is something else that we can rejoice in. Verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted. Well, how is he exalted? Well, maybe today you may say, well, I'm just a poor individual. I don't have very much. I don't have any wealth. My friend, you've got a lot of wealth. And believe me, friend, you've got treasure. You have a whole lot of treasure. You've got treasure in heaven. And if you ever stop to think what all you've got down here, what you have in Christ, why, we have everything. Well, Paul said this. He says, Therefore, let no man glory in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ, and Christ is God's. Why, I belong to Christ, and everything he has, he'll make it over to me. I have life. I have blessings from him. And even death is coming someday if he doesn't come in the meantime. And that's all from him. All of these things we can rejoice in. I don't care. The humblest saint, whoever's listening to me, that might be the poorest person on the earth. My friend, you are rich in Christ today. And you've got something to rejoice over. Now he says, but the rich in that he's made low. Because as the flower of the grass, 
he shall pass away. I always think of that verse when I walk across my college campus where I'm an alumnus of the college. Every building there is a name for some rich man. And you want to know where those rich men are today? Well, they're like the flowers. And I don't mean because they're pretty. They're like the flowers that bloomed yesterday, but they're gone today. And I think of many of those men, how powerful they were, the riches that they had, the influence that they had. And they're out somewhere today pushing up daisies. They are faded away. Oh, my friend, don't rejoice in the fact you're a rich man because you won't have it very long. When somebody says, you're wrong, I'm invested in gilt-edged bonds. I have stock today and all of that. You may have it, but you say you don't think that I'll lose that, do you? No, I don't think you're going to lose it, but that stock and bonds are going to lose you one of these days because in death you can't hold on to them. You can't take them with you, you see. The old adage that there's no pocket in a shroud. You won't be able to take it with you. The rich is even like the flower of the grass. It'll pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth. The grass and its flower falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways." I saw come on the screen the other night an old movie and a star that later on in life became a Christian. She's dead now. And I had the privilege of speaking to the Hollywood Christian group in years gone by, and she attended. And she was getting old at that time. And I looked at her. All that beauty that brought her a fortune and fame at one time All of that's passing away. God says the rich man will fade away in his way. All of her riches, all of that's gone today. She's been buried. Oh, my friend, rejoice today because you have a Savior that was not going to just save you for heaven. That's good enough for me, but my, he's going to help you today. And that is something all of us need. I have likened this to a university. James is very much like Proverbs, and Proverbs very much like James. When he made the statement, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That means undecided man. It means a man that can't make up his mind. Well, we said when we began the book of Proverbs that it was like a young man getting ready to enter school, and he gets a catalog from the different universities, and one comes from the University of Wisdom. Well, here again, we have a school, and it's called here the School of Hard Knocks, and it's the university that most of us are in today. And God wants to bring those that are his own into full-grown Christian, and he has a great deal of tests to go through, certain entrance examinations. Because God tests all of his children, see whether they're genuine, whether there's reality. He wants to weed out the counterfeit, the phony, the pseudo-saint. And then he wants to give assurance to the child of God. Now, trials are actually not a proof that you're not a child of God, but they are proof positive of your faith. Believe me, if you're not having a little trouble today, why, I'd question your salvation. If you're having trouble then that's a good test. And he says that you can know, you remember, and I want to emphasize that again, knowing this, that the testing of your faith. Now, God will test it in many different ways. And he does it in order, we're told here, that the testing of your faith will work patience in your life. In other words, God has a goal to be worked out. And that goal that's mentioned here, there are many others, is patience in your life. He not only wants to give you proof that you're a genuine child of his, but he also wants to produce patience in our lives. And there's been so much written on this particular subject, by the way. Old William Penn is the one that the state of Pennsylvania gets its name from. He made this statement. No pain, no palm. 
no thorn, no throne, no gall, no glory, no cross, no crown. And an anonymous writer said this, if all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? Where would the fight? But in the hard place, God gives to you chances for proving what he can do. And that's been put in many different ways. Someone else put it like this. If I must carry a burden, Christ will carry me. Sometimes we must be laid low before we'll look high. In ourselves, we are weak, even where we are strong. In Christ, we are strong even where we are weak. It's not how long you'll live, but how you're going to live. That's the important thing. A great many people, therefore, wonder, why in the world must I endure this? I got a letter several years ago from a man down in Long Beach, California. And this is what he wrote. He said, I have a wife who's been sick for the past 20 years and has been paralyzed for the last 10 years with Parkinson's disease. There's no hope of her ever leaving the hospital. How can a loving father make a person suffer and linger as she has? And I know that she loves the Lord. Now, this man was genuinely concerned, by the way, and he didn't have any answer for his problem. You can be sure of that. But the interesting thing is, I didn't either. I couldn't tell him why, but I could say this, that there was a purpose in it, and that God was working out something in her life. Now, as I move down here to verse 12, "...blessed is the man that endureth temptation." Now, that is, again, the same word that we had before that was translated testing. Or it's called trying in our King James. Here I'm using the new Schofield, and I think they've made a very nice distinction here. Divers' temptations or testing or temptation is a good word if you understand it in a good sense, as we're going to see. If not today, we will see it next time. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, this is God's method of developing you and me in the Christian faith. This is the way that he's going to enable us to grow. And he wants to produce patience in our lives. We've already seen that. But now he has something for the future. This matter of testing presents a program for the future. Testing of any sort, I don't care what it is, especially though if it's severe, a calamity or tragedy, it has a tendency of producing a miasma of pessimism and hopelessness. And that was the case of this letter that I read. I don't blame that man for feeling like that at all. Why? But God was doing it for a very definite reason. He had a purpose in it all. Now, the man of the world will sink beneath the waves of adversity. Even life at its best makes him pessimistic. How many pessimists there are today? How many cynics are there today? How many that are filled with bitterness and that have everything? We've seen an epidemic of suicide among teenagers in the past few years. We see them dropping out of society and today there are thousands of young people that have dropped out of society. And why? Well, they have no goal in life. The commentator during that period when it was at its worst, and he was one of the sensible ones, probably I should say one of the few sensible ones, said that back during the Depression, people had a will to live and there was very few suicides. But today, everything that's been given to them... They want to die. Now, when faith is tested and surrounded by darkness and the waves are rolling high and all seems lost, the child of God knows that this is not the end. It may be gloom now, but glory later on. 
The psalmist says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And now he says here that he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And I have noticed that people that suffer a great deal have been brought into a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been expressed like this. So much has been written on this. And let me read this. Is there no other way, O God, except through sorrow, pain, and loss? To stamp Christ's likeness on my soul, no other way except the cross. And then a voice stills all my soul, as still the waves of Galilee. Canst thou not bear the furnished heat, if midst the flames I walk with thee? I bore the cross, I know its weight, I drank the cup I hold for thee. Canst thou not follow where I lead, I'll give thee strength. Lean hard on me. You see, it brings an individual into a loving relationship with Christ and causes him to look forward to that day when he's going to be brought in his presence and he has something, very frankly, friends, to look forward to. The fact that the Lord Jesus is going to give him a crown of life. Now, let's look at that for just a moment. What is a crown of life? Well, there are many crowns that are mentioned in the Scripture that are given as rewards to believers. It's not salvation, but a crown represents a reward. It's something that is given to an individual. We had an unknown boy in California that won, what, five or six gold medals at the Olympics in Germany. I understand he has a movie contract and all of that. Well, Christian friend, he has a reward for those that will endure down here. He says they'll receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And that is what the testing does. It'll either drive you to the Lord or drive you away from him. So many Christians become better. And my friend, it's not going to be a pleasant experience someday to come in the presence of Christ of letting the very thing that a loving Heavenly Father was doing to you to develop your character and to bring you into a loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that today, these things are happening, but there's going to be a crown of lie. Now, somebody says, what is a crown of lie? I don't know what a crown of life is. I've never seen one. And I've read a great deal on these crowns. I sometimes wonder where some of the writers get all their information. But let me give you just my very simple interpretation of what I think the crown of life is. We have found out that there are different kinds of punishment for the loss. Some will receive so many stripes, some others will receive more stripes. There are degrees of punishment for the loss. There are degrees of rewards to believers. I do not expect to receive the reward that a man like Paul the Apostle or Martin Luther, John Wesley, received. I don't expect to receive a reward like they will. But I do hope that I can come in for something. And I, I'm very much interested about that. And I think a crown of life is that which brings you into a closer relationship with the Lord Jesus than anything else possibly could be. You remember in Revelation, he talks about he's going to give a stone to each one with a name written on it. And we have assumed that that means he's going to give to each one of us a new name. And I hate to ruin a good number that a quartet sings today. They sing, there's a new name written down in glory. Well, may I say that it's not the new name that's your name that's written down in glory. You've been given a new nature. But as best I can tell, the new name there means that he's going to give you a stone on which there is a name written of Christ 
that applies to you. For you, he means something a little special than he'll mean to somebody else. In other words, the Lord Jesus means something to you that he does not mean to me. And he means something to me that he does not mean to you. I can remember a time in my life as a young fella that I stood at the crossroads at a conference deciding whether I'd go into ministry or not, or I'd continue to follow a life really a sin. And there was a girl at that conference that I tell you I was very much interested in, and she was not really what you'd call conference material by any means. And I never shall forget that night, yonder in middle Tennessee, crawling up and under a water maple with its leaves just thick. And in the shade there, because the moon was shining bright, I got down on my face that night and told the Lord Jesus that I needed his help and strength to make a decision. Now, he means something to me, I'm sure, that he does not mean to you. You probably have another precious moment in your life, and that new name is going to be that. And I think the crown of life means that you're going to have a degree of life in heaven that somebody else will not have. There are a lot of folk that have gone through this world and have done nothing for God. Thank God there's one thief there on the cross that turned to Christ, but I can't imagine him getting very much of a reward. And when I put him down to a man like Paul the Apostle, and I can imagine what it's going to be someday when Paul comes up there. Just think what it's going to be, a crown of life. And Paul was very much interested in it. And James is interested in it here too, by the way, that there'll be a crown of life. And you can't receive that crown of life until you've been out on the race course of life today. And if you forgive me, get right down where the nitty-gritty is, right down where the rubber meets the road, right down there where life is being lived out. And my friend, if you can live for God down there, he's got a crown of life for you someday. And that's something to look forward to, by the way. Always think of that black deacon. He got up at a testimony meeting. They were being asked for their favorite verses. He got up and says, my favorite verse is, it came to pass. And the minister looked in amazement, and the people were puzzled. And finally, the pastor said to him, says, brother so-and-so, what do you mean when you say it came to pass? Well, he says, when I have trouble and I have trials. He says, I just go to the Lord and praise him and say, I thank you, Lord. It came to pass. It didn't come to stay. Thank God for that, friends. And I don't know a better way of putting it than that. The trouble hasn't come to stay. And he used the same argument in warning the rich here. You're like the grass, the flower of the grass. It may look pretty for you today. Life may be beautiful for you. And you may have a good day, but my friend, the flower's withering, and your riches won't deliver you. Someday you will stand before Jesus Christ. Every human being is to stand before him, some at the great white throne. But thank God there'll be a group called the church to go before him beforehand to the bema of Christ to see whether they receive a crown of life. Don't know about you? I'd like to have that crown. And he offers that crown to those. Now we have come to the next major division here. And God does not test faith with evil. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now, a great many people like to say, well, the Lord tested me. Friends, when it wasn't the Lord testing you at all. And James is going to make it very clear, in fact, abundantly clear. And listen to him now at verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Now, this is temptation to do evil. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, James makes it very clear that God never tests man with evil and sin. And if you want probably a more literal translation of this first statement. Listen to this. Let not one man being tempted say, I'm tempted of God. And if you'll notice, 
He doesn't use the noun temptation. It's now the verb, the action, if you please. And the natural propensity and bent of mankind is to blame God for every fumble, all of his foibles, all of his faults and failures and filth, and even the fall. From the very beginning it was so. You remember Adam said, "...the woman whom thou gavest me." Now, he was really passing the buck there. And the woman, she did the same thing. She said, "...the serpent beguile me." Well, may I say to you, all three were responsible for that matter. And today you hear questions like this, "...why does God send floods and earthquakes and kills babies?" And we blame God today for the greed and the avarice and the selfishness of mankind. That's what sends floods and earthquakes. Man built too close to a river. And then when the river gets up, they say they're having a flood. That's the way the river runs, you see. It's more pleasant to build by a river. It's near transportation, and it's where business is. And it's actually the greed and avarice of man that build down where it's really dangerous to build. God has given a warning on that sort of thing, and yet men pay no attention. Let me bring it closer to home. Now, if you're going to live in Southern California, I want to say to you, you're going to take a chance on an earthquake. You can be sure of that. We had a small one the other evening, my wife and I, We're sitting in the den, and I was rocking, as I generally do. And she said, didn't you feel that earthquake? She was on the couch there. And I said, no, I didn't feel it. She says, well, there was one. Well, the seismologists, they say that there's a big one that's coming out here. And yet, people are still living in Southern California, and they're still putting up high-rise buildings. Now, don't blame God if a slab of concrete falls off one of these high-rise buildings and kills one of your loved ones. Don't blame God for that. It would be much safer on the wide open spaces of Texas. I'm a Texan who wants to go back there. That's where I lived as a boy. I don't want to go back there. I know it's better now than it was when I was just a kid growing up. But I want to say to you, I'm staying, but I'm not going to blame God. When people live here and the earthquake comes, the warning has already been sent out. Now, men today with their philosophies, they blame God. Pantheism, for instance, says this, everything is God, but good is God's right hand and evil is his left hand. Well, God's no extremist. He's neither a rightist or a leftist, I can tell you that. And fatalism says that everything's running like blind necessity. If there is a God, what happened? He wound this thing up like an eight-day clock, and then he went off and left. And materialism, its explanation is this. What's the problem with the human race? Well, the loftiest aspirations and the vilest passions are the natural metabolism of a physical organism. May I say to you? That's their explanation of it. Well, God's answered it, for God cannot be tempted with evil. There's no evil in God. All is goodness, all is light, and all is right. You remember how John put it in his first epistle, 1 John 1, 5, This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, that is, he's holy, and in him is no darkness at all. And the Lord Jesus made this very interesting statement. The prince of this world cometh, and he find nothing in me. And friends, that means there's nothing in him. Every time he gets around me, he always finds something. Let me now introduce something that's theological, and you'll differ with this, because I gave this when we were in the Gospel of Matthew. But will you listen to this? Jesus could not sin. And somebody says, why was he tempted? Well, he said in Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said unto him, to Satan, now it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, God wants to save from sin, and he does not tempt you to sin. He wants to deliver man. And he never uses sin as a test. 
Now, he will permit it, as we shall see it in a moment, but he does not use it at all. And the Lord Jesus had no sin in him. Prince of this world cometh, found it nothing in him. Now, somebody says, then, why was he tempted? Well, I'll tell you why I think he was tempted, to prove that there was nothing in him. After he lived a life down here 33 years, Satan came with this temptation, a temptation that appeals to man's total personality, the physical side, the mental side, and the spiritual side of man. Now, the Lord Jesus could not fall, and the testing was given to demonstrate that he could not fall. Because if he could, any moment there, your salvation mind's in doubt, because the minute he yields, then we have no Savior, you see. And it was to prove that he could not. Let me illustrate that now with my very homely illustration, and I mean homely. I'm going back to West Texas. I lived there when I was a boy. My dad built cotton gins for the Murray Gin Company all over West Texas in those early days. And I can remember as a boy that we lived in a little town that was right near the, I guess, the West Branch. Not sure whether it's West or East Branch of the Brazos River. And in summertime, there wasn't enough water in that river to rust a shingle nail. But when it began to rain in wintertime, you could have floated a battleship on it. And during one of those floods, the Santa Fe Railroad had crossed right there near this little town. Why, the bridge washed out. It was a wooden bridge. They put in a steel bridge. And that always gave to us in the town something to do to go down and watch them build that bridge. And then they finished it, and they brought in two locomotives and put both locomotives on top of the bridge, and they tied down the whistles. And all of us that lived in that little town, my, when we heard two whistles, we knew that that was something. We all ran down to see what it was, all 23 of us. And when we got down there, why, one of the brave citizens of the little town asked the engineer there, said, what are you doing? Well, the engineer said, we built this bridge, we're testing it. And the man says, why, do you think it'll fall down? And this engineer drew himself up to his full height, and he says, of course it will not fall down. Well, then he says, why are you putting out locomotives on? He says, we are proving it won't fall down. Jesus was tested to prove that you and I had a Savior who could not sin. God can't be tempted with sin. And God won't tempt you with sin at all. Now, it permits it. Take, for instance, David. It says in Second Samuel, the 24th chapter, verse 1, it says, And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. And frankly, that was sinful. Now, somebody says, well, then, God did then tempt him with evil. No. You need to get always in the Bible the full story. And in 1 Samuel, you have man's viewpoint of it. From man's viewpoint, it looked as if God was angry with Israel, and he just had David do this. Oh, no. No. We are told over in 1 Chronicles, this is from God's viewpoint, in the 21st chapter, 1 Chronicles, verse 1 says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, who was it that did it? Satan was the one, and God merely permitted him to do it because of his anger against Israel, because of their sin. But God never tempts men with evil. Now, who is it that's responsible then for our propensity to evil? What causes us to sin must be a cause. Well, somebody says, well, you just called attention to it. It's the devil. Well, that's not what this passage of Scripture says. 